something around you is making you sick. Tell me what's really going on. Tell me what the hell's going on! Who are you? I don't know. Hello, everybody. This is Justina Bonilla with LatinHorror.com, and today we get to interview the director of the Blumhouse Into the Dark series episode, Tentacles, uh, that's exclusive on Hulu right now, is Glera Aranovich. She is joining us here today. Very excited to have her. This is the Valentine's Day episode. That's going to get very interesting very quickly. How are you doing today, Glera? I'm doing so well. I'm so excited to be talking to you guys today. I just want to say I really enjoyed this episode. I really uh, liked its interpretation of relationships. It it uh, holds no punches, that's for sure. <laughs> it's a pretty strong indictment on, on codependency. Well, considering everything that's happened in 2020, it works. <laughs> right? That was kind of one of the things that we thought because we actually began filming before sh pre-shutdown. We shot the first third in March 2020, got shut down due to COVID. Never knew if we were going to come back. Wow. And then we, sh we filmed the remaining two thirds in September. And by that time, you know, between March and September 2020, you remember, like a lot of us were shut in with our partners or people we yeah. had recently met. And so we were like, mm -hmm. this is weirdly fitting for the time. <laughs> This, this script really works with this. So before we get a little bit more into uh, Tentacles, I wanted to ask you, what was it that inspired you to go into filmmaking? Because according to IMDb, you've uh, not just done directing, but also done acting and a slew of other behind the scene things for film. Yeah, well, I was one of those film nerds since a very young age. Um, at around seven years old, I was in my first school play, at which point I was like, this is it for me. And, you know, my dad uh, happens to be a cinephile. My mother's very creatively minded, but she didn't go into the arts. In fact, neither of my parents did because they're immigrants from South America, from Argentina and Chile. My dog is on my lap, just <laughs> to be fully aware that that's what that is. Um, but yeah, you know, as is often the case for immigrants, you know, they had to really push to make a living, to, to, to establish themselves and build a safe space and a container for their family. So as much as they love the arts, they never dreamed of going into the arts. And then I have an older brother who also is a cinephile who almost went into film school. So I know that all of that just ultimately probably inspired me towards cinema and thankfully they were supportive and I I did do a lot of different things. I continue to do a, a little roles here and there for friends, but really directing became very obviously the, the main draw by the time I was 10. I was already like editing little movies in camera or on my computer. Any time a, a teacher or professor would allow me to make a film instead of like write a book report, I would I was that student, you know? Um, and it's just always been film. So what are the films and filmmakers that uh, have a big influence on you in your style? Ooh. I mean, great question. Uh, specific to Tentacles, I would say some of the, I mean, the heavy hitters that always influence me, but specific to this project, I'd say Tarkovsky for sure. Mm -hmm. I love I love that kind of Russian and Eastern European slow, creepy burn. Um, and I love the films of Yorgos Lanthimos, you know, the guy who did mm -hmm. The Lobster and um, The Favorite. Oh, that was good so good and i would also say um fincher's zodiac is a huge influence on me when it comes to more thriller horror sensibilities because i love i love a slow burn i love something that makes you feel like the pot is slowly boiling and someone's got to get out of the house or they're going to be in trouble well i definitely got that feeling off of your movie awesome. so what was uh so seeing how you've actually done two of these into the dark episodes with blumhouse I was wondering, uh, how did you become uh, involved with Blumhouse? Actually, it's my first one with them, but I don't blame you for making that mistake because uh -oh. I'm on a TV show called In the Dark. So it's my first, It's my and what's so funny is I'm in Canada right now doing two more episodes on In the Dark, the CW show. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's just my, my resume is just going to be In the Dark, Into the Dark, In the Dark, In the Dark, Into the Dark. <laughs> right. Um, oh, but... Goodness. I got involved with Blumhouse 
actually because of the script. The script was written by Ali Peckman, and she shares a story by with Nick and Tosca, who mm -hmm. has a couple shows at Hulu, as you may know. And mm -hmm. um, they had the script set up at Blumhouse already. Blumhouse bought the script thinking it would be a great fit for Into the Dark. And I had just had a general meeting with Nick and Tosca's company, Cat. And they said, you know, there's this one project we think you might be a great fit for. Give it a read, see if you like it, and if you want to pitch on it. And I read it, I liked it, pitched on it, and here we are. That's fantastic that you got that so quickly. So well, um, <laughs> it was it wasn't quite as easy breezy as I might have made it sound, but <laughs> I wrote like a 60 page director's treatment. I really oh, worked wow. my, my butt off to get the gig, but um I was so thrilled because it was Blumhouse. You know, I wanted to really bring put my best foot forward because getting an, an open directing assignment is actually extremely challenging so i knew that i was going to be under a lot of scrutiny as a first-time feature director even though i'd had tv right. experience um and commercial music video experience they mm -hmm. were going to want to see can i do the job you know so are you a fan of horror in general i am i mean i i love genre like i love I love all of cinema. So within each genre, there's always something so delicious to watch as it's kind of evolved because cinema is such a young medium, right? So like we've only really had it around for 120 years or so. Mm -hmm. And so we get to see this rapid growth in each genre. And what I love about horror in particular, and to be clear, I'm like a total scaredy cat. So when I do watch <laughs> horror, I have to like, I'm not one of those people who like our writer can watch like The Shining by herself at night with all the doors and windows open, unlocked. <laughs> like she, she's one of those people. I'm not one of those people. I have to watch The Shining during the day with, you know, with like a buddy on the phone or someone <laughs> sitting next to me. But I still love it because horror shows us a couple of things. Technically and artistically, it often is pushing the envelope as to what mm -hmm. film can do, right? If you think about special effects, body horror, it's, it's actually extremely innovative filmmaking. But then from like a kind of more societal theory perspective, horror cinema shows us what we're afraid of. And right. that's extremely valuable. Like cinema is like a mirror to our society. It shows us what are we romanticizing? What do we what do we find beautiful in the dominant culture? What is the dominant culture? And what's really cool about horror in the past like five years, especially thanks to Blumhouse's like Get Out, we're starting to really address some of the deeper seated fears um, that at least we, we know are at large in the United States. And that is something that excites me about the genre for sure. And what did you like about the script uh, Tentacles? Was there any one thing or a couple of things that popped out to you that said, wow, I wanna be a part of this? The title. <laughs> first first and foremost, I mean, no joke. I love octopuses. I've been a cephalopod nerd for many years. And I mean, they're like aliens. They really are. They smell with their skin. They can change color and texture. It's crazy what they can do. And I've always wanted to make something that had something to do with them. So that really intrigued me from the start. And I mean, I, I was also, again, really drawn to the fact that it was a Blumhouse production. And I mean, how many production companies can you say are like a household name? Right. Not that many, you know, and Blumhouse is one of those few. Um, but to bring it back to the content of the script, I I love, I tend to skew in the things that I write more like sci-fi, but they're always with a very like character base. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, I don't really write um, films like Tentacles myself. And so I was kind of excited to do something that isn't what instinctually comes to me as a writer. And what what was especially appealing was this deep dive into what codependence looks like and how dangerous love can actually be. Fatal attraction with octopuses. Uh, yeah. Yes. So I noticed in the house uh, when we have the characters Tara renovating it, mm -hmm. that I noticed that there tends to be a color theme throughout the house, like a blue and white, but then not to give too much away, then you have his room, which is green. So I was wondering, was that an artistic choice on your end or was that something already in the script? And if so, what was that a metaphor for? Because I found that very fascinating. Oh, I love that you do that. Um, yes, when in doubt, everything was intentional. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of those directors that some department heads find very tedious because I everything is very specifically chosen. But some department heads like Eve McCartney, the production designer on Tentacles, who did all of the production design for all the Into the Darks, which is incredible. She's an incredible artist and technician. She loved it. I like when I first 
get hired on a job, I'm like, let's talk color story, let's talk themes, let's talk about overarching broad arcs for each department so that every department is firing on all cylinders to support the story arc. And for Tara, when she first meets that house, and this is in the first third, so I, I don't think it's a spoiler, you know, like, you know, the one that she ends up renovating, it's super earthy and dingy and wood paneled. And she is obviously, she's this, the cause of the tidal tentacles. She has this oceanic um, quality to her and to her story. And that's why, you know, we wanted to push towards blues, push towards a coldness, um, which could kind of contrast to their love flourishing. And Sam, you know, his old room being green, it, it kind of bridges between the Terra blue and the warmth of what the house used to look like, right? The earthiness, it kind of green feels like in between brown and blue to a certain extent. So that was the thinking there, but good catch. Right, and so speaking about filming, what was for you your favorite scene filming, uh, to film and the scene that was the most difficult to film? Great questions. I mean, I, I, I don't wanna give anything away and a lot of my favorite sequences are at the end of the film. So what I'll broadly say is anything that has to do with visual effects or practical, just like technical stuff, I love it. That is the stuff that gets me up every morning to do the job. I like to push myself, I like to learn. And a lot of my favorite filmmakers are extremely technical filmmakers like Kubrick, like Fincher. Um, so broadly speaking, anything that has VFX, I tend to love. More specific to this piece, what I'll say is the intimacy scenes. It is an erotic thriller. We have a few intimacy scenes. Mm -hmm. And most people are surprised to learn that those are actually the most technical scenes in a lot of movies because, yeah, yeah absolutely. If you think about it, it's kind of like a, a fight scene, but without <laughs> physical violence, right? right? You still have choreography. You still have, I mean, we have a whole role on set now, thank God, because the unions stepped in because it didn't used to be this way. We have a whole role on set called intimacy coordinator, whose job really? is, yeah, to negotiate and make sure it's safe for the actors. And our intimacy coordinator, Corinne Evans, is incredible. And we just had a great vibe. You know, we rehearsed those scenes. Into the Dark moves very quickly. There's not much time mm -hmm. for rehearsal but right. all the intimacy scenes were rehearsed and pre-choreographed, pre-negotiated. Those are scenes also in which this the set is closed. So unless you are specifically needed to run camera or a lighting gag or what have you, you're not invited to set during those scenes. So you also have to make do with fewer people while you're right. filming. Um, and you can imagine a, a huge part of my job as director is just making sure my actors are safe, making sure right. everybody's safe. But, you know, their horror stories, no pun intended horror wise, but right. you know, of like of young actresses and actors being put in compromising situations in right. intimate scenes and like being having PTS, severe PTSD for like like it could ruin their career. So right. it, it really is not dissimilar from a from a fight scene where you could break your back, you know, you could, there's actual risk involved. You could ruin somebody's life if you don't take good care of them. And then on top of it, I didn't want to just show, you know, we've seen a lot of those, we've seen a lot of sex yeah. in the history, you know, where it's just like yeah. a guy and a girl, you know, heteronormative, like get together, they have sex, culminates in male orgasm, sometimes in magical mutual orgasm and it's done and we were not interested in that we wanted to tell a different version of intimacy and so those actually ended up being my favorite sequences in fact i would say the big sex time lapse which if you know viewers do watch it they'll know what i'm talking about that might be my favorite scene in the entire movie speaking of filming that uh, you filmed a third of this pre-covid and then about two-thirds i guess in september yeah. So, uh, post COVID. So, what was that experience uh, like for you as a director? Oof, another good question. I mean, you can imagine March 2020 getting shut down after five days of production. We didn't know anything about the pandemic then. We just knew it was here and we knew that we couldn't avoid it anymore. And we knew that the risks involved with being you know, a, a film set is like a little Petri dish. Like it's a bunch of people in close proximity to one another. And we just knew that it wasn't, the safest thing to do would be to shut down. So there was no doubt that that was the right thing to do. But of course it broke all of our hearts. You know, mm -hmm. for me, for the writer, for the lead actress, it was all of our first features. You know, the lead actress, right. her first time being number one on the call sheet or being the lead. And yeah. 
you know, I've, I've been waiting for that in my career for 10 years and it broke my heart. But at the same time, it was a no brainer. Like there was no part of me that, oh, I wish we could continue because what's the, what's the, yeah, the risk is like, there's no movie worth a human life, you know? Right. <laughs> but as a result, you know, I spent summer of 2020 not anticipating to ever get to finish. And I made my peace with that while I, like many other people, got really into gardening, you know, <laughs> tried to find a way to survive. Um, but then when we came back in September, I mean, directing directing with COVID is a, is a different ball game because of just the simple things you could relate to, you know, like think about how annoying it is to have to talk through a mask and a face shield. We had to do that mm -hmm. for 10 hours, 11 hours a day. And oh, so wow. we move much more slowly. We couldn't have every department on set at the same time. You know, it's just, it's slower. It requires way more patience, but then also, and this is the last I'll say about it. It was really exciting because again, we all really wanted to finish what we had started in March. A lot of us were, like I said, first time filmmakers or first time feature filmmakers and very excited to have the opportunity to finish. But also it's a family, you know, making a movie is like building a little family with a group of people. And it was really nice to reunite with a lot of them. Last question would be, since this is the Valentine's Day episode, I was wondering what's your favorite Valentine's Day treat? Like <laughs> one, the one treat you look forward to for Valentine's Day. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, I'm just a chocolate person. I'm, I'm basic girl. I'm so basic. I need it. The thing is I can't even call it a Valentine's day treat because I have chocolate almost every day. Of, every <laughs> week. But I mean, I think the, the fact that it's legitimate, you know, if like I were to just go, if I were allowed, I'm quarantining right now in Toronto, but if I were allowed to go to the grocery store and just buy a giant heart box of chocolates, no one would bat an eye. And that, <laughs> That is a treat. No judgment <laughs> on Valentine's Day for eating all the chocolate. Oh my goodness. Well, Gleda, thank you again for joining us. We really uh, appreciate your time. And again, to our viewers, uh, the episode of Tentacles comes out today, I believe, the 12th. Yes, it is freshly out today. Thank you so much for the opportunity to chat about it. And thank you so much for joining us in, as you mentioned, in quarantine during in uh, Toronto. Yes, happily.